Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. We are very lucky today to have the, I'm going to make sure I got it right, I've got it written down here. We have, I'm going to make all your titles correct. The department, uh, the chairman of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, uh, who holds the Vivian L. Smith Chair in Regenerative Medicine at Baylor. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the exciting news was uh, she was just elected to the National Academy of Sciences but she was also elected recently to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So very prominent recognition for one of our top scientists. Uh, let's start off first. How did you celebrate? Gosh, well, I was getting on a plane when I got the first phone call. So I, I actually just treated myself to a little glass of champagne on the plane. What about the lab? Did the lab get excited? The lab got very excited and, and they had a little celebration for me. And then the department had a celebration for me yesterday as well. You have been studying uh, sort of stem cells and the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow for your career. And so for our audience, tell what are those cells and what do they do? Hematopoietic stem cells are also called bone marrow stem cells and they regenerate the blood. So you have about a dozen different kinds of cells in your blood. Some of those that make up the immune system, which you like to talk about in your, in your um, presentations. In my thing. <laughs> yeah, and uh, your red blood cells that carry oxygen everywhere. And of course your platelets, which are important in clotting. And your stem cells are constantly regenerating all of those cells and you need them to sustain your blood over your whole lifetime. And so that's why we have this great population. And, and so what has been the area that you've been most interested in studying these cells? I would say in the beginning of my career, I was interested just in what, how those stem cells functioned and how they were regulated. So if you have two, if those stem cells make blood too quickly, you can have leukemia. Right. And if they don't make them quickly enough, then you can have anemias. And so regulating their output and the number of those stem cells is really, really important. And then over time, my research has really evolved more towards um, cancer because some of the genes that regulate how stem cells work normally, when those genes go awry or get mutated, then you have various cancers. And so that's one of the things that we've been really studying in the past 10 years is leukemia development see, from I stem see. cells. And, and you found a particular pathway that is involved with differentiating cells. What, can you describe that? There's a, two different ones, but the one that I'm most interested in now is, is a DNA methyltransferase. Mm -hmm. So DNA methylation is a tiny little modification get, that gets put on your t DNA, and it's been known for many years that it can regulate DNA itself. And so we found that when this, this protein, which puts on the DNA methylation is lost or even reduced a little bit in, in the amount that it allows stem cells to grow but inhibits their differentiation. Oh, is that right? So you get lots of stem cells, but they don't make blood as well. And so you can imagine over a long period of time that causes lots of problems. So you, one day we were talking and you were telling me about the, how the cells get methylated and how that is sort of an index of how cells age too. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because there's a lot of interest now and how do you determine, you know, how old you really are? Right. So DNA methylation marks, because they are kind of permanent marks on the DNA, can be used to look at sort of the history of the cell in many different ways. And so there's a lot of interest in the field right now in um, sort of characterizing all your DNA methylation marks in your blood. And you can almost do like an, uh, an assessment of somebody's molecular age from how much DNA methylation they have and where it is and where it has been eroded from in the genome. So so I'm, if I were to like check mine, and it, could it be like I'm 230 years of age? Well, it depends or on if you haven't been taking care of yourself. <laughs> well, or my job, my right. job. No. Well, well, one of the things... What about stress? Yes, stress. yes, yes. So so it's hard to know if you if you measure the mark in yourself, you don't usually have those marks that are measured over a period of time. But what we can do is compare those marks in you to many of other people, many other people your age. And so we can say, do your met does your methylation make you at a molecular level? Is it does it make you look older than your true biological age or younger than your biological age? I so see. we hope that it makes us look younger. I mean, it's what's well, pretty cool. I mean, it, it, we don't have any measures of, of cellular age really that are accurate. So that might be a big breakthrough actually if we could figure out how to do that. Just draw a tube of blood and say, you know, your actual your your, your physical age may be one thing, but your metabolic age may be another. Something like that. Exactly, exactly. And no one's really quite using it this way yet, but if you if that molecular age 
was a really good indicator, mm-hmm. then you might say, well, what can I do to make my, give my molecular age, a li- make it a little yeah. bit younger? Yeah, yeah. You know, interventions. Interventions, yeah, being yeah. more fit or eating differently or if there was a miracle <laughs> anti-aging drug. Just tell me it's not reducing my wine consumption. <laughs> that oh, would be a tragedy uh, of yes. un- untold <laughs> proportions. <laughs> So uh, well, the other thing I was really interested in your work is the, uh, the impact on bone marrow transplant because, uh, you know, the, it's been used many times in, for pa- patients who have uh, AML or different types of leukemia to do a bone marrow transplant. What are the real barriers for successful transplantation when you're using your own hematopoietic stem cells? Well, usually we're getting, for a bone marrow transplant, you're getting bone marrow stem cells from a, a donor. Another person, yeah. Right. And so the biggest uh, barrier is getting a match, right? You want the closest match possible so that you can get an engraftment of the of the donor. So you often marrow. get it if you have children or parents right get it or from siblings. Their kids. siblings. Siblings is is often some of the best. Um, that is a barrier. Um, one of the things that we would like to do in the long term, many of the people in my field that study stem cells, is we'd like to be able to grow stem cells so that if you're taking bone marrow from a donor rather than taking a lot of you know, like a gallon of, of bone marrow, actually, it would be more like a half a gallon or less at, from a donor. Uh, rather than doing that, we could take a teaspoon and then grow those stem cells out. That's kind of a ho- holy grail of understanding when you, stem when cells. when you culture stem cells, like in, in vitro or in a cell culture dish, don't they tend to differentiate? Exactly. So that is a barrier. So there's really not a good way to expand them sufficiently to give them to a, a bone marrow, in a bone marrow transplant. And have you looked at the, in terms of uh, differentiating cells on different pathways, is that one of some of the things that your laboratory has been involved with? We have not done that so much, but that is also an area of interest in the field. So, for example, uh, red blood cells and platelets are are things are, are products that are given to patients under different circumstances. And if we could grow stem cells indefinitely and then push them down one pathway or another, then we could just make those products, and then you wouldn't have to have blood donors for everything. So, tell me, in, now that you're recognized for all your work. What, what, what are your plans? What, if you think about the next five to ten years of your lab, where, where, are you, where are you going with it and what do you think you're going to be able to accomplish? I mean, that's a great question. Um, that's the first time you said I had a d- decent question. That's, <laughs> you have lots of great questions. <laughs> Janet, I asked a good question with my sister. I just want to <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Um, I mean, first of all, it does make me relax a little bit. I think as, as a scientist, you know, especially in a medical school, you're constantly on this treadmill that you have to get more grant money and the grant money will fund your work and which, and the product is the papers. And if you get more papers, you get more grant money and things like that. So I kind of feel like, oh gosh, at least I've done a good job in the last 25, 30 years. And so hopefully that will keep happening. The, the field is evolving. There are some interesting um, intersections between aging and evolution of the blood system that I'm very interested in, and I'm hoping to understand that more. The, the blood system, it turns out, these stem cells are evolving. There's like a little Darwinian evolution that's going on inside your bone marrow all the time. And it turns out that with age, some of your stem cells win over the others. It's like it's like a marathon runner because they've been living in your body for, you know, 50, 60 years and some of them win just like in a race. And we're trying to understand why some like of them like leukemia. Win. No, I'm just Well, there <laughs> some of them are pre-leukemias, but yes. most of them don't turn into leukemias right. and and yet it's a marker of aging. Mm-hmm. These cells that are the winning uh, cells are a marker of aging. If they appear in you when you're younger, um, it might be a marker of earlier aging, of this sort of a molecular aging. It can be a risk factor for some cancers and even some other non-blood diseases. Yeah, yeah. And so we and others in the field are trying to tease that apart. Well, this is great. So you have breaking news today because you've gone from science to metaphysical thought. <laughs> And what philosophy. evolution? Evolution That's in the blood? <laughs> <laughs> well, the battle within the you know the metaphysical thing yes. about who's winning, who's losing. It's totally a medical me- <laughs> metaphysical thing. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, anyway, thank you for sharing all of your insights, and it's always great to hear from our fabulous scientists. And congratulations on being elected to the National Academy. You certainly deserve it, and we're very proud of you for that. So thank you. You're welcome. I would yes. like to say one more thing. Oh, go ahead. I feel very fortunate to be here, and I really fe- think that I would not have been able to achieve what I have achieved without the support of a, a fantastic place like Baylor College of wow. Medicine. And it's it's the trainees in my lab. It's 
the people who run the school, such as yourself, but even like our HR department, the people who manage my grants, and and uh, you know the people, the coffee lady in in the cafeteria that you know keeps. She just us got going. elected to the National Academy. She's too. wonderful. <laughs> many many people know her very very well. You should interview her sometime. <laughs> Billy, do you have the hundred dollars I gave you? We're going to give her for the, uh, the paid advertisement. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you no, so much. No, but I'm very serious. It's, well, it's we really important to be in this environment. Well, thank you, Dr. Goodell. Thank you very and much. Congratulations again. Thank you.